All righty. So we're going to talk a little bit about non-motor. So what we're going to talk about is what is Parkinson's disease? I always start at the beginning. Pathophysiology, what it looks like motor and non-motor, right? We all know the motor so well, but what about the non-motor? And that's the bulk of what we're going to talk about. And then what happens when medicine wears off and dose failure related to non-motor symptoms and some of our treatment options. So what is Parkinson's disease? It's a progressive neurodegenerative disorder. It's the second most common. Does everyone know what the first is? Alzheimer's, right? And Alzheimer's is more common in females, Parkinson's more so in males, and we don't have enough dopamine, and the neurons degenerate in the basal ganglia substantia nigra. And it's a whole brain problem. And that's where really all of the non-motor stuff come in. And that's why it's important, right? Because um, it affects all of the other neurotransmitters, not just dopamine. So what you can see here pointing with the yellow arrow is a normal um, area in the brain, the substantia nigra where the dopamine is at. And then you're seeing a, the blue arrow, that's a Parkinson's brain, and you see that there is not much of, if any, of that black area. So what does PD look like? Well, all of these people had Parkinson's disease, right? We know some of them very well. So I always talk about the three S's, right? So that's what I want everybody to remember, the three S's, slowness, shakiness, stiffness. Us doctors, we like to make fancy words, bradykinesia for slow, tremor for shaky, rigidity for stiff. Um, and then if you lose your postural reflexes where you have things like orthostatic hypotension and you lose um, other autonomic functions, then that can be a fourth criteria that we can use. You must have slowness, bradykinesia, to have Parkinsonism, and one other of those three. And that's required for the definition. And remember that Parkinsonism is not Parkinson's disease. There's many, many causes of Parkinsonism and Parkinson's disease is one of the causes. We're just talking about Parkinson's disease today and primarily focusing on the non-motor symptoms. These are the motor. We all know them so well, and I think it's nice to remember by the three S's. So some of the non-motor symptoms are neuropsychiatric problems, autonomic problems, problems with sleep and wakefulness, and then sensory problems. And I think sensory problems can be very bothersome, but some of the most forgotten by clinicians. And so I always like to try to re remind people that that can go hand in hand with Parkinson's. So this is a research study that was done on non-motor symptoms. So let's talk a little bit about the non-motor symptoms of Parkinson's. Oh boy, okay. So some of the neuropsychiatric, we have depression, anxiety, apathy, impulse control problems, dementia, mild cognitive impairment, problems with making decisions and executive function, anhedonia, just lack of interest. And then we all know hallucinations and delusions well because we talk about that a lot. But all of these things right here on this list can be related to Parkinson's disease itself and not from other causes. Now, sometimes they are, but um, it all is part of the Parkinson's disease problems. So there's a lot of variability within the research as to how much depression is related to Parkinson's disease, but we think about 40%, so four out of 10 Parkinson's patients will have clinical depression. And much of that, I think, goes untreated adequately. And again, this is just bringing it to the forefront to remember that it's something that you should address with your physician. And it can be a, everything from major depressive disorder to um, dysthymic disorder or just even minor depression. So how do we treat depression? Um, dopamine, we know helps depression. And um, what I am quoting from you now is I'm quoting specific medications that have been validated um, by an evidence-based medicine review in movement disorders, which is the journal that is published by the Movement Disorder Society. So the International Movement Disorder, Parkinson's Disease and Movement Disorder Society. So they have found that these specific medications are efficacious. That's not to say that 
other medications would not work in certain patient situations, but this is simply what has been validated out there. So they say that pramipexol is one of the most efficacious to treat depression if you wanna use a dopamine therapy. They also say that tricyclics are helpful, things like nortriptyline or um, desipramine. And interestingly enough, they say the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, which are the ones that we use the most for depression a lot of times, don't have a lot of evidence except Effexor, which is venlafaxine. Other things that people are looking at in research studies are the omega-3s, um, TMS therapy, which here in the Tampa Bay area is a booming business and industry, and um, cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, I think the last two, as more research is published, are gonna become very efficacious um, methods to really help treat depression. So this is um, a table from the study, just reiterating what I just said. Um, anxiety, I see this all the time. And you know when I see it is fluctuating anxiety. And I think patients and um, caregivers are the most um, frustrated with fluctuating anxiety. And fluctuating anxiety really comes from dopamine wearing off many times. So patients will tell me, you know, I feel a little anxious in the morning when I wake up, I take my medicine, I feel better for a couple hours, and then all of a sudden I became anxious again, I don't understand it, nothing is happening, nothing should make me anxious. Well, those are some classic signs of dopamine wearing off. Um, you know, they'll tell me they feel sweaty, clammy, you know, they just, they even have some chest discomfort, things like that. And we really need to do a deep dive into how do you address um, this dopamine wearing off if it's really just a non-motor. Um, there are some studies that have shown mindfulness and physical therapy combined together really help with anxiety. And there's phenomenal great data coming out on mindfulness and how that helps all the neurodegenerative diseases, things like Alzheimer's, variety of different dementias, um, multiple sclerosis, um, Parkinson's disease, all of these things. So what is mindfulness? It's a psychological process that's out there and it um, brings one's attention to experiences occurring in the present um, moment without any judgment. And um, you can develop this practice through meditation and through other kinds of training. And what they found in this study is that when they were looking at neurodegenerative problems, specifically Parkinson's disease, they had decreased distress and it had all kinds of downstream effects, um, both in a motor and non-motor basis um, once they started the mindfulness. So here's the effects of cognitive behavioral therapy on mindfulness in MS, Parkinson's disease, and this one also looked at Huntington's disease. So cognitive dysfunction and dementia in Parkinson's disease, and almost everyone has a little bit of cognitive problems. That's because of the bradyphrenia. So brady means slow, phrenia is thought. So you're gonna move slower and you're gonna think slower. And how do we address that issue? And it can be everything from problem solving, planning, problem setting goals. You can't shift quickly from one thought to another. Um, we know there's visual spatial problems and that brain eye connection um, and then just straight learning and memory issues. Um, 30 to 40 percent of you are going to de develop dementia at some point. What's been validated in the research studies as efficacious treatment for PD dementia is Exelon. That's not to say that Aricept doesn't work, but what we've seen in the research studies, and if you want to go on true evidence-based, it's Exelon or Rivastigmine. Um, I always tell my patients, I'm going to give you your um, brain exercises. So this is a list of what I give classically to my patients. So I want you every day to wake up and say, today is, you know, and you're going to say the date. And um, you're gonna repeat that throughout the day and force yourself. You know, many of you are retired and when you were working full time, as you went about your day, you were forced to repeat what day it was. So you wanna be able to do that on a daily basis and just say today is and um, go from there. Reading, I like people to read um, for two things. One, just whatever you like to read for pleasure, 
um, fact or fiction, you know, history, things like that. And then also to stay up on current events. And I used to say, I want you to read the news. And one of my patients got very distraught with me. And she said, you know, I don't think I want to read the news. The news is bad. Everything is bad. So just current events that can be something positive and good that's happening in your local community, or it can be worldwide events, but whatever, you're just keeping up with day to day what's happening in the world around you. Then I talk about one way brain games and two way brain games and how that can be beneficial. Um, because when we play two way brain games, having that interaction and having somebody check up on you and making sure if you put a domino down that's wrong somebody's going to give you feedback about that but maybe if you're doing a crossword puzzle or a word search you might not get that feedback so both are good and both enhance brain connectivity and thus brain function and then in your community i think it's very important you're going to have a lot of unexpected things happen when you're in social events and that keeps you on your toes that keeps you thinking quickly and that really helps with the bradyphrenia um, what we found is that ex if we have problems in the area of executive um, function or you have executive dysfunction in parkinson's disease azelect or risagiline has been shown to be helpful and beneficial and that's something that you can use and even if we've added in um, risagiline it will help with end of dose wearing off with levodopa apathy and fatigue these are probably the two toughest things i have found to treat in parkinson's disease um, and a lot of times we can't even differentiate it from depression and it all goes hand in hand but this is just you are so tired, you do not want to do anything, and you're exhausted all of the time. It can be from Parkinson's itself. Some of the medications can cause it. But I always tell my patients, don't forget, we need to do due diligence to make sure that nothing else um, medically is going on. And one of the things I always look at is just the basics. You know, what are your blood counts? What are your um, electrolytes looking like? What is your kidney function, your liver function, and then thyroid can be a big one in this area. And just because you have Parkinson's doesn't mean you wouldn't have a thyroid problem. So we wanna make sure we're taking a full um, comprehensive look at you. Um, some of the treatment options for apathy and fatigue, they're tough. We don't have a lot of good stuff. There's some data to show that Exelon or Rivastigmine, Azelect and Risagiline can be helpful but uh, adequate sleep, exercise, but again, it's hard to treat. Hallucinations. Um, these can be medication-induced or disease itself-induced. Nuplazid is great. Um, we like that. We don't really use Clozaril anymore, and Nuplazid is really, Pimavan Sarin is superior to Seroquel. Sleep problems, almost universal in Parkinson's disease. Um, and that includes all of the things like restless leg, periodic limb problems, REM sleep behavior disorder. You know, they've done the research studies to show people who are younger who have REM sleep problems, almost all of them go on to develop a synucleinopathy. Again, tough to treat these, um, some of them, but we always start with treating the REM sleep behavior disorder pretty aggressively. And clonopin works well, melatonin, um, can also be beneficial, but clonopin is kind of our go-to one. Um, the excessive daytime somnolence is the tougher one to treat there, which we have to really closely monitor that. Um, autonomic problems, again, very, very common, not as much talked about, but urgency and frequency, sweating, sexual problems, orthostatic hypotension, um, and that can lead to falls. And so it should always be addressed. If you have any problems with lightheadedness, dizziness, feeling strange when you change positions, your physician should be getting what we call orthostatic blood pressures. That's when you're lying down, sitting and standing and comparing them. Um, most of our urinary symptoms are from overactivity of your bladder. Um, Vesicare is the one that's been validated in research studies, but I also use Mabitric a lot and get good results with that. Um, bladder retraining can be helpful and we'll send you to the appropriate healthcare people who do that. Um, it's sometimes done by the physical therapist and the, that works very well. Um, Botox is helpful. Um, some of the um, 
adenosine A2A receptor antagonist can be helpful as well. Um, and we also use desmopressin. Orthostatic hypotension needs to be identified. The morbidity and mortality related to this in Parkinson's disease can be high and it can be treated well with some of our medications to raise blood pressure. All of these are effective and work well. Northera is very nice because it doesn't have as many side effects, um, but sometimes for insurance reasons and purposes, your physician may try midodrine or Florineth first. And my patients in Florida don't wanna use compression stockings most days. Today, I think all of them would though. Um, GI problems, we have constipation, nausea, vomiting, drooling, you don't taste things as well, dysphagia, reflux. Again, constipation needs to be addressed, treated, talked about, all of these do, but constipation is, again, almost universal in our patients, and we really should have it addressed. Talk to your physician about it. Um, I kind of talked a little bit about this, diet, exercise, fluids, diet, exercise, fluids. If you've checked that box, you can do some of the probiotics, prebiotics, but most of my patients are gonna move on to Marilax fairly quickly because most of them are pretty good at the um, top ones. Marilax, I like the best and seem to get the best results with. Magnesium is also great, and magnesium will help with that calming effect and also the anxiety. There's a product out there called Calm Magnesium, which I like and I give to my patients in the evening, and that works really well. And some of the last two we go to if nothing else is working. Sensory problems, these happen all the time. And the vision issues, I like all of my patients to be following with ophthalmology. Um, just to do their annual checks to make sure nothing is changing there that we need to address from that perspective. Wearing off. So motor wearing off is easily identified by most Parkinson's patients. They tell me their tremor goes away and then it comes back. They say they're super slow and then they can walk better and faster. They're stiff and they can't move when they wake up in the morning. They may even have some dystonic posturing and then they take their levodopa and they feel so much better. And so that's easily identifiable. It's the non-motor stuff that's a lot tougher to identify. So what's dose failure? Because I think some people don't understand the difference. Dose failure is when it simply doesn't work and when the levodopa doesn't work. Now, the thing to remember is we can't call anything a dose failure till we've driven up that dose of levodopa fairly high. If you have Parkinson's disease, if we get the dose high enough of levodopa, it's gonna work. If it doesn't work, you don't have Parkinson's disease. Now that's not to say you can't tolerate side effects or the side effects are intolerable, thus you can't take the medicine, thus we need to do something else. That's different. But a dose failure means that you're just getting no benefit from it and it's likely because the, high, the dose isn't high enough or timed correctly. So let's talk about some of our treatment options again. Dopamine is my go-to, right? For even for non-motor symptoms. We need to make the dopamine so it's working correctly because you have a lack of dopamine, that's your problem. So we need to give you more dopamine, whether that's scrunching the doses together or larger amounts. Remember, you cannot absorb more than 200 milligrams at a time. So you, there's no point in taking two more more than two tabs at a time of the 25 slash 100 dose. So if you're already at two tablets, then we've got to move you closer together. So DBS and non-motor symptoms. So obviously it profoundly affects the tremor. It profoundly affects rigidity and moderately to mildly, depending on the patient, affects the slowness or the bradykinesia. But what I don't want people to forget is that when we implant a DBS system into you, your non-motor symptoms are also gonna be benefited. And that's the important thing to also remember when you're making a decision to get DBS. So people always ask me about cognition. We've shown that in multiple studies now, cognition is not affected. Um, so this is a study when we implanted 
um, DBS into the subthalamic nucleus, what happened to people's sleep? So that was the question. A Parkinson's patient who has sleep issues, who has a DBS, how do they compare to people who do not have a DBS and have Parkinson's disease? They slept better. Their sleep efficiency was better. Their REM sleep increased. And they had decreased need to use the bathroom at night. Now that's the decreased nocturia, you can argue that uh, many different ways, right? Are we awakening at night because we're stiff and we're slow and we're uncomfortable in bed and then when we wake up, we feel the urge to urinate, so we get up and we go to the bathroom? Or is it that there is truly an effect of the electricity being provided to the brain on the actual bladder overactivity itself? I think that couldn't be debated either way. But regardless, it doesn't matter to the patient because they're sleeping better through the night and they're having to get up less to go to the bathroom. So one of the expectations is if you go to the bathroom a lot at night, your DBS should help with that. Pain, and this is the one I love because again, remember how I said in the beginning, pain is one of those things that really goes along with Parkinson's disease sometimes. I believe a lot of the pain comes from two aspects. One, rigidity, the stiffness that's not adequately treated and also just um, sensory dysfunction that we know happens and, um, in Parkinson's disease. This study was published in 2014 and um, pain prevalence decreased significantly from 70% to 21% for people who had pain with Parkinson's disease. When they had a DBS implanted, they were much more comfortable. That improved their quality of life. This is phenomenal. This is what we want, right? This is what we're looking for. Um, so there was a 2017 study that evaluated non-motor symptoms in late stage PD and advanced PD with DBS. So they looked at people um, who had a DBS and who didn't have DBS. What happened with their blood pressure, right? Because we know as Parkinson's disease progresses, we increase medication, so you're at greater risk for orthostatic hypotension. And then Parkinson's disease itself, as it progresses, puts you at increased risk. So we know that blood pressure decreased after we take levodopa, right? So in patients who did not have a DBS put in, when they took their dose of levodopa, their blood pressure went down. Patients who had a DBS in, their blood pressure maintained more stability. Again, is this because you're taking less levodopa or is it that the electricity in a way through the circuitry is helping the autonomic system to maintain blood pressure better. These are all things that we're looking at and investigating currently, but regardless in the here and now, we have shown that patient's blood pressure is more stable with a DBS in. Again, same thing that I talked about previously in the 2014 study, the 2017 study showed that patients who had DBS and had better pain control. So all of these things that are so bothersome that are non-motor that we've had such trouble controlling are really benefited with DBS. Fatigue, the bugger that I can never treat very well, is helped with DBS. Um, we in, but what we saw is that there wasn't a lot of change in the advanced patients. So in the patients who are in the um, more moderate stages, we see that they, their fatigue is better, but in the um, more advanced stages, there was not a lot of change in fatigue, but there was no change after a levodopa dose as well. So that's the area that we're still trying to treat a lot. We're seeing some benefit with DBS and fatigue in those mild to moderate stages still, but in the advanced, we're still struggling in that area. Anxiety, again, no change after levodopa, but it was significantly improved in advanced PD for those people who had the DBS in. Anxiety, again, that one that fluctuates with the levodopa dosing, we see more stability when we have a DBS in. Um, for completeness, I do feel like I do need to bring up the levodopa intestinal gel or the duopa because that is another continuous delivery treatment method for Parkinson's disease. Um, and there has been some evidence showing that non-motor symptoms like in DBS are also helped with duopa. 
And this 2017 study looked at the non-motor symptoms with intestinal gel patients. On average at baseline, the patients had severe non-motor symptoms. At 12 weeks, the intestinal gel patients had a significant reduction in non-motor symptoms. And at each study visit up to 60 weeks, um, these non-motor symptoms remained reduced. So for completeness and in all fairness, I wanted to bring up the Duopa as well as an efficacious treatment option for both motor and non-motor. So what is the ideal treatment of PD? Right, we all want a restorative therapy, and that's not what this talk is about today, but I'm just so excited that I have to throw it in there really quickly. I was recently in Nice, France, and I got to see Sarah Jones, um, the executive director of PMDA there in Nice. And you know, she and I both had conversations about how exciting it is that we were looking at the posters on exercise and um, PD, both for um, prevention and for helping the disease itself. And that's the best thing we have right now. And the data is great. Um, Brain-derived neurotrophic growth factor is released when we exercise and that helps with neuroplasticity. And I do a whole talk on that. And it is some phenomenal data. So my advice is keep exercising. That's our best restorative therapy. Um, and this is what I tell everybody, right? So important to remember. Um, is the serenity prayer and you know people get so frustrated with their non-motor symptoms, you know fatigue anxiety constipation pain um, That you know, we're gonna work together. We're gonna work our best to do what we can But there's some things we keep don't have control over so we have to figure out how to manage them the best we can and I always like to end with this slide, 10 common tips, and I have an eight and nine year old, and I always tell everybody, these are what I hopefully send my kids off to school each day to remember, right? So follow your directions, designate a first responder, be organized, use trusted sources for information, get the most out of your appointments, have faith in yourself, ask for help, don't let negative feelings get you down, be adaptable, and laugh. So I hope um, that was a little helpful today and everyone um, enjoyed listening to that. Here's my information. I'm sure they'll post that afterwards. Um, I have about less than five minutes to um, have everybody. Can you see me now, Andrea? Yes, we can. Okay, yeah. great. So hi again, everybody. I hope that was helpful. If you have a couple questions, I can take a couple questions, but then I must get back to my conference that I am at today. We want to make sure you get those, uh, those CME credits or right. whatever the right uh, <laughs> is. Um, okay, so we did have some questions in the chat. Um, okay. So um, Robert had questions said that he's considering DBS. Does DBS eliminate the up and downs of on time and off time? He says, sometimes I can sleep, sometimes I can't sleep. Sometimes I'm depressed, sometimes I'm not depressed. I want to rule out some variables, and, but I am scared to have brain surgery. So I guess that's, that's a, a, a big question, but you know, what do you hear and kind of what's your response to that, Dr. Right, so our answer always is, when it comes to DBS, whatever your best levodopa on time is, that can be your expectation for your best DBS outcome. The idea is that best levodopa on time will be maintained for a longer period of time with DBS. So if you get an hour of beautiful on time, I would hope to have you to have more hours of that on time. To completely elim eliminate peaks and troughs is not a realistic expectation, but to have less. So if you're going from here like this, what I want you to be doing is like this. Um, we don't completely, unless you're intolerant to levodopa, eliminate levodopa altogether with DBS either. Um, obviously, there's some patients who aren't on levodopa because they can't tolerate it because of side effects. But if you are somebody who's tolerant to it, we leave you on a very low dose and we use your DBS as your primary means of therapeutic intervention. 
Okay. So I hope that answered the question that yes, ideally all of those non-motor symptoms are going to improve. Um, to have them completely 100% resolved with DBS likely is not a realistic expectation, just like having all of your motor symptoms gone is not realistic either. Okay. I think that to manage expectations, that's a great way to think of it. You're best right. on time. Correct. You know, you're not going to go back 20 years, but your best right. on time is, uh, right. is a good way to, um, to think about it. Okay, great. Let's see. Um, someone kind of had a quick, quick question. Have you heard of patients post DBS having a better sense of smell? No, I have not. Um, unfortunately, I think some of those very sensitive um, nerve endings um, in that um, in our cranial nerves in you know our nose area probably likely are damaged and they don't um, return their function. So that's probably not going to change. And you know, smell and taste go together. So if you're looking for, oh, I want to taste that wonderful food. I'm a very food person. I love um, food pairings and combinations of things. So I know if it were me, I would, and I didn't know the answer to that, I would be asking that question. Will I be able to taste better? And unfortunately, we think the answer is no to that. We don't have it, those nerve endings are likely damaged. You sound like maybe a, a foodie gourmand type person. <laughs> I don't know about that, your, but I enjoy food. <laughs> what do you tell your patients who come to you, you know, complaining of those, you know, missing that out of life? Just more spice or more bold flavors? Oh, I see what you're saying. What do I tell the patients who can't taste and want to taste food like I so enjoy? Um, yes, I guess that would be it. Or, um, you know, sometimes changing up the textures, that can be a compensation because you're going to still have that sensation of the textures. So focusing more on the textures um, can help too. And um, Kathy chimed in, more dessert. Because right, is it sh sugar is one of the last... Uh, sensations. <laughs> yeah. Yep. But don't give yourself diabetes, but yes. <laughs> I like dessert too. So chocolate's delicious. I think it being lunch with ducks, you know, the, the yep. food. Uh, <laughs> if we could send food through the computer. <laughs> yes. Absolutely. Okay. Well, I'm looking at um, my, my watch. Are you good for um, one more question? Or one more question. Go? Yes. Okay. Oh, I better pick a good one then. Um, okay. So someone said you mentioned um, the Duopa gel at the end of your presentation. Mm -hmm. Is it an either or? Do you consider Duopa or DBS for your patients? Um, I don't know if you could talk about you know, how they, those two therapies and how you. Yes. Um, so unfortunately, currently Duopa, although initially less invasive, tends to be more cumbersome for the patient and believe it or not, may potentially, depending on the patient, be, have more risk of infection because it's a tube hanging outside of your body right? And it's just much more cumbersome. So currently in my practice, if I'm going to select an intervention and the patient is a DBS candidate, we will have a very long objective heart-to-heart con -heart conversation about DBS and the benefits of that. If a patient is not a DBS candidate for whatever variety of reasons, then I'm going to have the conversation about moving to Duopa because that's a great delivery system for a patient who is not a DBS candidate. I think when Duopa becomes, um, when the actual system itself, meaning how they get the medicine into your body, is easier and less cumbersome for patients, I think we'll be using it more frequently. But currently, I don't use it a lot just because of those challenges related to it, even though it's a phenomenal delivery system. There could be a patient who chooses Duopa first and then wants to keep Duopa and move on to DBS, and that would be very logical. 
I have not seen a patient yet who had DVS first and then needed to have Duopa because the DVS was efficacious enough that they didn't need the Duopa. Okay, got it. But and they, but there's no contra. There's no contraindication. Correct. No contraindication. Okay, great. Well, I think if you have to skedaddle, then we will um, wish so, you best. Or if you had any final, you know, wrap up, wrapping up words of wisdom, go for it. Um, I think that would be to stay positive and, um, you know, really keep a good relationship with your physician and um, ensure that you are asking the questions and being persistent because we have so many efficacious delivery options for patients in today's Parkinson's world that for patients to be out there suffering, I don't think is good. <laughs> so I want the, if I can deliver things to the community to tell them that there are options for you out there and your quality of life can be phenomenal, I want you to keep searching for those options and find the healthcare provider that can deliver those options for you. And so my goal in these kind of talks is to give you information and give you tools to go to your local community to get those resources that you need. Um, and I think that's very important. And I think that's also PMDA's goal. Um, so we work well together in that sense. <laughs> Absolutely. We hope that maybe, you know, there's a little nugget of information that'll prompt, um, open up a discussion with, you know, your own physician or your own physical therapist or your own care team, even, you know, amongst uh, um, family members. So absolutely, our, our missions are definitely aligned. Yes. Um, two last things, Andrea. Um, one is I want all patients to know this is one thing that I've been promoting a lot in 2019 and I'll promote also through 2020. And, you know, I think it kept on the Medicare regulation for 2020, but my office does need to double check that. But in 2019, um, one of the Medicare benefits was that you annually got a cognitive assessment that was paid for um, by your primary care physician or neurologist who are or whomever. So if you're concerned about your cognition and you want an objective office test done, your physician should be offering that to you, just like he offers you your annual pap smears if you're a female or your annual blood work if you're male or female. So that's one thing to remember. And the other thing is, even though I do have to leave a little bit early today, if you send me a list of remaining questions or any patient has a question, feel free to email me and I'm more than happy to respond via that way. Okay, thank you so much. You're welcome. Bye, have a great day, everybody. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Bye, Bye. Dr. Boland. We'll see you later. Thanks. Okay, everyone. So um, as you heard from Dr. Boland, you know, if you do start to, uh, um, you know, as you let what we talked about today marinate and you and some questions come up and you do have, um, you know, some, some follow-up um, um, questions, our, I can put it in the chat, but our email address, our main email address is info at pmdalliance.org. And we are happy to be that conduit to pass those, to forward those to Dr. Boland or introduce you. Um, I think, um, you know, as I mentioned, her unique background as a physical therapist, a former physical therapist and a movement disorder specialist, um, she can really get in the weeds about um, you know, a lot of the, uh, the overlap between um, those, two, uh, those two worlds. So uh, whether it's about, you know, non-motor symptoms, DBS, um, or some other things, because that was a, a very uh, comprehensive presentation, um, definitely uh, email us what you would like to know, and we will um, we'll be happy to, to loop in Dr. Boland so she can chime in. So um, if, let's see, I think I got to everyone's question who put it in the chat, um, but if anyone has any other um, 
uh, anything, any other comments or anything they want to bring up. Um, before we say goodbye, I'll mention a few upcoming um, Neural Life Online events. So on January 31st, we have an episode of Parkinson TV Live. Um, that is a, uh, a collaborative program where we watch an episode of Parkinson TV, which is an, um, a TV series about um, Parkinson's that the University of Rochester puts together. And then we'll have a live movement disorder specialist to just do rapid fire Q&A. Um, the topic is apathy. So um, because we have a full 30 minutes of Q&A, um, yeah, start to think of those questions now. And we want to, our goal is to jam in as many questions as possible in that, that 30 minute Q&A section. Um, the movement disorder specialist is going to be Dr. Mindy Bixby, who practices at Scripps in um, San Diego, La Jolla area. And um, she she can take your questions. We want to try to stump her. Um, so that is January 31st. Um, of course, our website has all our information on um, upcoming programs. Next month, fourth, um, fourth Wednesday of the month. Oh, it, it slipped out of my head. Rebecca, what's our, um, what's our topic and our doctor next time around for lunch with docs? We'll Thank leave you. I can't remember the topic, but we do have Dr. Ospina coming on. Oh, very good. Yes, I think it's um, okay. Well, I won't, I won't misspeak, but um, so February fourth Wednesday of the month. Maybe I'll look even look at a calendar. And um, Dr. Ospina is in um, Arizona, so that's going to be noon Mountain Time, and that is February twenty sixth. And um, we hope that you are signed up for our emails and that's the best way to know what the topics and the speakers are. Um, we have quite a um, suite of programs um, like Lunch with Docs that we had today, Parkinson TV Live that I mentioned. Um, oh, also Therapy Break. So Therapy Break is gonna be about nutrition. Um, and that is a topic that we get so many requests about. So we're really excited to have a registered dietitian um, come and talk about Parkinson's and nutrition and the role that um, eating well plays in your care plan. Um, and that is going to be on February 19th, and that is at 4.30 Pacific time. We like to move the times around in case someone has, you know, boxing every Wednesday, then um, our programs are at a variety of times, so the more people possible can join in. So let's see, that is, that's kind of a snapshot of what we have coming up. We're always open to hearing the topics that you want to hear about. Um, I, some of my favorite Lunch with Docs are when it's a um, you know, a, a audience proposed topic. Um, when we ask the doctors what they want to hear about, you know, um, then we only get what they want to talk about. But we invite you to put in the chat or send us an email, um, whether it's a very specific um, topic or something broad. Um, we will source an expert who either has research background or clinic background in that topic, um, and then turn around and, and get that out to, uh, to you in the community. So um, that, yeah. Okay, so William wanted to know about the, um, the link for today's slides. Uh, the best thing to do, William, if you email us. Um, we don't put them online as a link, but if you email us, um, then we can always share, um, share those with you. So again, the, the email is info at pmdalliance.org to get that. So, all right. Well, if no one has any other questions, then I'll let you get on your, with your day. Hopefully, we're going to all take the doctor's advice and laugh, designate a first responder, 
uh, oh man, I'm uh, my pop. Qu I pop quizzed myself, and I don't think I'm remembering all of them. So follow directions, designate a first responder, laugh, listen to your doctor, um, and exercise. So. Uh, anyone who wants to say bye, I always invite everyone to, to turn on your camera so we can all um, wave at each other like silly people. Bye. Oh, I see you, Motev, there. Bye. Bye. Thanks so much for joining us, everyone. Oh, I got a laugh out of you, Motev, so one out of ten done. But thanks for joining Lunch with Docs, and we hope to see you at another NeuroLife online program soon. Bye. Bye, Robin.